I just released a video on my main channel where I got almost all the way finished with a three table $30,000 furniture package and I found trapped moisture in the wood rendering all three tables essentially unusable. I was despondent when I found this out. All of that wood should have never been used to begin with. So I called my wood supplier and I asked if he would come talk with me on camera to discuss what happened, why it happened, and how I can hopefully avoid similar situations in the future. As a woodworker, I found this discussion so interesting and important that I've actually added a bonus chapter into my virtual epoxy workshop, meaning everybody that signed up for that virtual epoxy workshop will have access to this chapter. I'm not gonna charge more for it. I'm not gonna offer a virtual epoxy workshop 2.0. As I learn more, I share more. So I think this is that important and I hope you find it useful as well. So I called Aaron, explained the situation with the trapped moisture in here. And he said, what can I do to make it right? And I said, I don't know. And then I called him back and I was like, hey, come by, let's at least get something on camera so we can talk about it, explain what's going on. So Aaron, the owner of Gobi Walnut, welcome, welcome to my shop. Wish I was here under better circumstances, but thanks for having me, Cam. Yeah, man. So, got your bigger, fancier moisture meter. Yeah, so let's see what we've got here. Starting off at a solid 16. These are always the wettest spots. 25%. So, whenever you guys are checking a slab, the wettest spot is always going to be in the vertical grain part of the slab. This, the flats on portion has the widest surface area, so it's typically will be the driest, which is what we're seeing here. And if you see yellow streaks in walnut, those are always spots that you want to check. So right here is the wettest, which is maxed out 28.5%. And it's basically all the way through. So put it bluntly, how does this get out of your shop like this? I mean, typically when we dry stuff like this, we're going around and we're checking the surface and then we're pin reading those wettest spots that we get. Mm -hmm. But sometimes uh, being that we're dealing with old dead and dying material, trees will get infected, which kind of limits the flow of water throughout the slab. So if we go through and we check spots and most of it's reading dry, then we assume for the most part that is dry. So sometimes you'll have these isolated pockets. Now in a situation like this, where it's virtually all the way through. Like so so that's, that's another question somebody's brought up. Could I go on the backside and router it out and inlay wood or epoxy and have it be fixed? Um, no, it's so hard to tell. So it's, you know, if, if you're, Thinking of the slab as like a three-dimensional piece, there are pockets of water. They can be all over. Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily go straight through the slab. Hmm. So it's really tricky. So we could, um, we, could, we could shave a veneer off the top and put it to plywood. And you, gonna... I mean, honestly, the best thing to do would be to get it close to your final uh, thickness and then put it back into the kiln, re-dry it, and then reevaluate. So in, in my thoughts today of what I'm going to do, at this point, I, 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 I want to talk to you before I talk to the client. You know, you want to have the options figured out for the client. Right. Um, and regardless what's hap what happens, whether we start with new wood or try to salvage these ones, thought probably worth a shot to put this in the kiln. I've never put epoxy in the kiln, but it's pretty flexible, especially yeah. as it warms up. What yeah. temperature is your kiln at? Uh, we'll take these up to between 130 and 140. Yeah. Um, I'm so really, I'm really curious. We <laughs> have put epoxy in the kiln oh, yeah. and for the most part, everything has gone fine. It, the, the riskiest part of kiln drying is exposing freshly surface material to extreme heat uh -huh. and to air. Uh -huh. So that's the riskiest part. What, ha what, what happened? Uh, just the risk of movement is higher. Um, it's just like if you were to resaw something, you know, and you open it up and right away, once you open up that grain, it just wants to move and get sure, squirrely. Sure. Um, well, yeah, I'm very interested. What's your, what's your stock looking like for, for new slabs? Um, actually better than average. All right. All However, right. I know the stuff that you like to work with, and this is part of the reason why you chose these, you know, lots of grain variation and lots of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's also the riskiest for stuff so, like this. So it leads me to another question. Is this, and you can be honest here, is this 
on me? Is this on you? Is this on nobody? Is this something that someone potentially could buy a slab from you and you've, been, you've done everything right and they still get something with trapped moisture? No, it's totally on us. Um, I mean, there are certain types of walnut slabs that are riskier than others. Mm -hmm. So like typically the gnarlier slabs, stuff that has like lots of movement or lots of like rot and degrade and stuff, mm -hmm. those are the riskiest ones. But we also have all the tools necessary to catch it. What, what's your, can we get this, these slabs dry like with defects? Like can we get them totally dry? I mean, yes. The um, time that it will take is like the unknown here. Yeah, what is, I mean, what, is I it, mean is it a week or six weeks or so six months? Situations like where we've had stuff like this in the past, what we'll do is surface it to open up the grain, which in this case you've already done, and then we'll put it back in the kiln. I've seen it dry in as quickly as three weeks, and I've seen it take months mm -hmm. before. So what what happens if some sweet woodworking kid in Minnesota sees you on a YouTube channel and, mm -hmm. and buys wood from you and he doesn't have a YouTube channel and what, what do you do when he calls you and says, hey, this thing's got trapped moisture, I built a whole table. What would, what would you do for your average Joe Blow? Um, typically in a situation like that, we'll offer a full refund and especially if they're across the country like that, they just end up keeping the material. Mm -hmm. Um, we also offer replacements if they're interested in that and we'll cover the cost of the freight. We try to make them as whole as possible, mm -hmm. but you know, paying for freight is something we've, we've done, mm -hmm. uh, multiple times and, uh, comping for material, even giving people credits. We try and just, there's no, um, kind of set plan for dealing with, uh, something like this. It's just reimbursements and credits and sure sure you mentioned that this can happen it's not you know and i appreciate you owning up and it's it's a thing um what how how common is it you know is this you know one percent ten percent yeah so it's it's not um terribly common at any given time we'll have 50 to 60 slabs drying in the kiln and it happens a few times a year i would say less than five typically um but when it happens with one slab in the tree, that kind of sets off an alarm for us and that it's usually a tree issue. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take all those slabs from that tree off the website. What do you do with them? Just we'll just take them through the process, uh, put them back into our own inventory and get to them when we get to them. So Blacktail likes that weird stuff. He loves the yellow streaks. It, it'll, come, it'll come around, but it'll be six or seven years probably before it's actually addressed. So we could just kind of kick it to the back burner. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so they just go way back and you're... We just queue. let them air dry for as long as we can. And then once they really start to look seasoned, very grayed out, then we'll put them into the kiln. Interesting, interesting. Um, I got a question. I, I got a lot. So, you know, you're also the subject of uh, some, some heat on my last video because we had the same problem, which is what really got me thinking about testing these ones a little bit too late. Um, had that round table, where it had those cell collapse, the depressed areas. Yeah. And I got a lot of people commenting and questioning saying, so what, why not, what happens with wet wood? So do you want to help educate people on what happens with wet wood? You know, why can't you use something with small pockets of trap moisture? Sure. So a slab or any piece of wood is always trying to find its point of equilibrium. So it wants to be in balance with the atmosphere around it. And when there's a pocket of moisture in a slab where it's wetter than the atmosphere, eventually the atmosphere will pull that moisture out. Sure. And then once the moisture leaves, there's a crack or some sort of depression or some, something that's actually damaged uh, or something that will actually damage the slab. So if someone is fine with some depressions and some cracks, you could have a wet wood table? Um, Sure. <laughs> so that's. That I wouldn't is, recommend it. But. Yeah, and that and that's. I get countless people that are like, dude, who cares? It's going to be you know pretty flat. I'm like, eh, people well, will pay thirty grand. It'll be fairly flat, but the biggest issue is that your it compromises your finish. So eventually, once you spill something on the table, yeah, it'll penetrate, and then it's just a matter of time before you get rot and other sorts of issues. Sure. All right. Well, anything else you want to add? I appreciate you coming on a short notice. No, I just, I know it's, I know it's the best part of your job. I feel terrible and, um, you know, I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> you should, you Public should. Apology. <laughs> You're not forgiven until we figure out how to make this right. So, well, but we'll, no, I we'll appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. Man. Appreciate yeah. it. 
If you can't tell by the down jacket, it's been about six months since this happened. And the first thing I did right away, called Aaron at Gobi, which you saw. Second thing I did, schedule a call with the clients, which I thought was gonna be a really tough conversation, but they could not have handled it better. They were very understanding. I told them that I didn't recommend reusing these slabs. There's too many variables. I couldn't trust that we could get these dried with no potential defects. So what we did with those slabs that I built in that other video is we're putting them into the kiln. I'm not sure what we're gonna do with them. I'll probably try to finish them once we verify they're dry. Maybe I'll just give them away to one of you guys in a separate video. As for the client slabs, after about a week or so of looking, I remembered some absolutely stunning Bastone walnut slabs that I've seen before, and I've actually purchased two of them for a separate project. The only problem was they were about three times the cost of the slabs that I bought that weren't any good. So I reached out to Aaron at Gobi and I said, Aaron, if you really wanna make this right, you'll give the clients these slabs at no additional cost. And he quickly just said, okay, that's fine. So the clients are getting wood that is much, much nicer than the original slabs they purchased, but it's gonna be several months to get them dry, which is where we are today. We are just about ready to start working on those slabs. That video will probably be out in the next couple of months, so stay tuned for that as well. So what lesson did I actually learn from this experience? I always knew that I wasn't supposed to work with wet wood, the lesson that I learned is I no longer take a wood supplier's word that a piece is dried. I now check every piece of wood that comes through my shop with a moisture meter to ensure that everything I work with is properly dried, not just in one spot, but all over the entire slab. And I know that's hard for a lot of you. You don't have an expensive moisture meter, or maybe you're buying the wood from across the country and you can't physically put your hands on it but I would advise you take those extra steps. You maybe get a Zoom call with your wood supplier and watch them go through the entire slab with a moisture meter. Some of them might not wanna do it, but if you have a good supplier like Gobi Walnut, who as you saw, even when they had a problem, they would do whatever it took to make it right. And they don't want problems either. So in the end, it should benefit both of you to ensure that those slabs are properly dried for your climate.